Praise the Lord. All right, so as we present ourselves before the Lord in prayer. Present yourself before the Lord and talk to the Lord in prayer. For the Lord to prepare your heart, your mind, for the word of God tonight. That God will give you ears to hear. Heart to understand. The will to obey. So the blessing of the word will be upon your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible story tonight. We thank you because you're always giving us understanding of your word. Lord Jesus, we're present before you today, standing upon the promise that will never fail, that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in their midst. We know you are here tonight, and we know that you are teaching us yourself in these words that we're going to learn. Lord, we pray every heart will be open to your word tonight in Jesus' name. Spirit of the living God will welcome you here. You are the great teacher of the church. And you guide us into all truths. You don't drive us into the truth. You don't push us into the truth. You lead us and guide us into the truth. As many as are willing. Lord, we pray that tonight you make every one of us willing to be led and guided in Jesus' name. And as we reveal the truth, this great truth to our hearts, Lord, we pray, we'll receive, we'll accept, and then we'll give a hand to the Lord to lead us to that glorious city by and by in Jesus' name. Bless all your people tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7 tonight. We're looking at verses 13 and 14. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord actually has been talking about the kingdom. And it began in Matthew chapter 5. He has spoken about the kingdom even before that time. But in this Sermon on the Mount, he concentrates on the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Because you know as I know That nobody is going to live in this world forever That no matter how long you live on earth Then the end will come And after that end There is a place you want to go And the Lord in his desire That you and I and everyone Will get to heaven To that kingdom of God He's been talking about that kingdom. And now as he's bringing the message of the Sermon on the Mount to a conclusion. Because we're getting to the last part, the final part of chapter 7. He doesn't want to forget the most important thing that he is entering into that kingdom. Look at Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. From the very beginning, he puts the key right there. And that's the key of the whole sermon. That's the key to his coming. That's the key to his sacrifice that he offered on the cross of Calvary. That we will get to the kingdom of heaven. And he's been showing the way. It's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. And because of that, he puts the key right at the beginning, at the door, at the entrance to the sermon on the mount. And he says the important thing, as you listen to this sermon, as you listen to this message, let your mind, your heart, your focus be on the kingdom of heaven. He says the reason I'm preaching to you. It says the reason I came to the world It says the reason I'll be going to the cross to die for you Is to get you to that kingdom of heaven And then it says you must make up your mind There must be an attitude There must be a kind of receptivity That you're going to have You're poor in spirit And then it says that you will get to the kingdom of 
heaven. And then he tells us, not only that, when you get to the kingdom of heaven, who do you suppose you are going to see? Who do you want to see? Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, you see what the Lord is saying, and you see the very emphasis of his message, and the very emphasis of his coming, and the very emphasis of everything he did, number one, to get to the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Number two, to see God. And it says, everything I do, everything I preach, every activity I get involved in, every invitation I give you, every call I give every one of you, every impact influence I have on you, it is so that on the final day, you will see God. Turn it around. Anything you have. And you see, Jesus does to you. If at last you didn't see God, Jesus said, that's a waste of time. And a waste of wonderful treasures. He says, I came so that you get to the kingdom of heaven. He said, I came so that when you get to that kingdom of heaven, you will see God. Then he now tells us something. He said, it's not going to be all easy. It's not going to be, you know, like you're going on the bed of roses to be able to see God and to be able to get to the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10, it says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, but theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says, the moment you make up your mind, and you say, now I know. The reason why Christ came, now I know. The reason why Jesus preached what he preached, now I know. The reason why the Lord has given me the sermon on the mount is so that I get to the kingdom of heaven and then I make up my mind. I'm going to get there. He said, there will be persecutors on your way. And those persecutors are going to try to do their worst to make sure you don't get there. But thank God you are going there. And then he says, though they persecute, and though they oppress, and though they may put some fire, and flame, and flood, and pressure, and pain upon your life, here is what you need to do. That you'll be looking at the blessedness at the edge of the way. You'll be looking at the joy, the glory, the bliss, the reward you're going to have when you get over there. Therefore, you endure the persecution. That's why I said, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward. Where? In heaven. You know the focus of Christ. The focus of Christ is not just bread and butter. It's not that you have everything here on earth. If of all men, if in this world only, we have all the blessings and everything in Christ, will be of all men the most miserable. The goal of worship, the goal of study, the goal of learning and the goal of looking at all these things is so that we'll get to that kingdom on the final day. That's why it says you rejoice even when the pain, the persecution is there. Because it says, because great will be your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, which were before you. That's why you started heaven. The golden city, the beautiful city, that great city where there are many mansions. It says there are many mansions there go to prepare a place for you. And now it says if you are going to get there, you know now at the conclusion. He wants to tell us there might be people who have missed it at the beginning. And you need to understand that the goal of everything, the purpose of everything is to get to that glorious city, heaven. That's why he now says, come on to Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 13. It says, enter ye in at the gate. Enter ye in at the gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, 
Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. You want to remember that before Christ came into the world, to Israel, to Jerusalem, the religious leaders among the Jews assumed a great position, a position of authority, as if they had the key of knowledge and the monopoly of religious understanding. And they assured themselves and assured other people that they had already entered through the gate. They said, we have entered already through the gate and we're already going in the way that leads to heaven. Those who are deceived people, deceiving all the people. Two things. Number one, they were deceived. Number two, they were deceiving all the people, those religious leaders. You know what they thought? They thought the gate is a gate of circumcision. And they thought the way to get there, when you enter through that gate of circumcision, they thought the way was the way of religious practice, the fasting and the praying and the giving of alms and the doing the best you can, turning over a new leaf. They thought it's the way of resolution. I will not do this. I will not do this. I will not do that. They thought it was the way of personal human efforts to be able to get to heaven and so they thought they were in already and they were teaching other people get through the gate get through the gate and you know even after Jesus Christ had taught them very clearly and he said enter through the straight gate and go through the narrow way that leads unto life would you be surprised even in Acts of the Apostles chapter 15? Don't open, I will tell you. There were people that were still telling them, except ye be circumcised, ye cannot be saved. They never let their dogma. They never let their old ideology that the gate to heaven, to the way that leads to heaven, is the gate of circumcision. But the Lord Jesus now came to tell them Now if you talk like that Then everybody will get there Because every Israelite was circumcised Therefore there will be many, many Getting there But few there be That find it And the multitudes who had been circumcised They were still in the broad way Like those people thought those days There are many people that still think like that today They think that you get into the kingdom of God By the natural birth We are children of Abraham Father and mother are religious people and because we are born by religious people We have entered through the gate Many people today they think The gate is a gate of infant baptism And when you were born You were eight days old They made a mark of the cross with water on you Or they sprinkled water on you And that infant baptism to them Is the gate to the kingdom of God if we think like that, then everybody that answers a Christian name in quotes will get to heaven. If that is the gauge. Some people think the way after you have been baptized in water, then the way to get to heaven is belong to a denomination. Attend church regularly. Obey the laws, the do's and the don'ts of your denomination. And do your right, do the right thing and pay your deals in your denomination. And once you do that, you have entered through the gate and you are walking in the way that leads to life. If we think like that, if we talk like that, then multitudes of all these people that say go to church regularly and then they are not born again, but who have gone to heaven. But you know it's not so. The Lord Jesus Christ, the personification of the truth. Truth personified. He himself has told us very clearly and very plainly. He says, look at it now. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Enter ye in. Look up here for a moment. If I tell somebody, why are you staying there? Enter in. 
The implication is the fellow is still outside. And I'm telling him, I'm beckoning on him, enter in. That means that most of the people that Jesus spoke to here, when he prayed the summer of the mount directly, they were still outside. They had not entered in. Now, let me ask you a question. Were these infants, were these little, little babies and toddlers? The answer is no. These were adults. How do you know they are adults? Well, it tells us when you bring your gifts to the altar, that's what he told them. Infants don't bring their gifts to the altar. Toddlers don't bring their gift to the altar. And you remember, somebody has something against you. Leave your gift there at the altar and go reconcile with him. That's an adult. And when he says, if somebody will force you to carry something and make you to go one mile, go with him twain. That's not an infant. That's an adult. When he says, love your enemy. Do good to them that hate you. That's not an infant. That's an adult. When he says, when you are going to pray, get into your chamber. Infants don't have chambers like that. And then close the door and speak to your father who is in secret. Those are adults. When he says, if you know how to give good gifts unto your children, those are parents, those are adults. Those who are not infants. And he told these adults, he said, enter ye in at a straight gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads unto destruction. And then he says, many there be that go in, there are then he said, because straight is the gate. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find each adults. That means then the Lord is talking about adult conversion, adult decision. You see, there are many people, they do not understand that it's adults that get saved. They think it's, uh, you know, little, little children, school boys, primary school children. When you say, ye must be born again, they think it's for little kids, little children. No. Even when Jesus said that, he said that to Nicodemus, an adult. So then understand, you must be born again, adult. You must enter in through the gate, adult. And you must walk in the way that leads to life eternal. It's an adult decision. And that's what the Lord is talking to us about today. The narrow way that leads to heaven. The narrow way that leads to heaven. We're going to divide the study to three parts. Number one, the necessary gate to eternal life found by few. Non-negotiable, compulsory, indispensable. The number one thing, the one thing you must recognize, the gate through which you enter to find life eternal. And then number two, in number two we have the narrow way to everlasting life followed by Feel. It's telling us it's not just the gate, it's the gate and the way. Two things. What means you enter in, that's gate. You walk in, that's the way. It is the entering and the walking in and walking through that leads us to our final destiny, a final destination. That means life eternal. And then he tells us now, point number three, which is uh, the destination that the never ending wonder in eternity for the faithful few. Let, let's come to number one. The necessary gate to eternal life found by few. The gate, the gate, narrow, small, that you need to just squeeze yourself in. Because it will not take you plus sin. It will not take you plus self. It will not take you plus society. It will not take you plus ideology and philosophy. Just you. The gauge 
is so narrow. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. I told you before that what straight there means small, narrow. Then in verse 14, because straight is the gate. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. We're looking at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 verse 24. And the Lord emphasized this again. Actually, somebody else, somebody asked a question. And in response to the question of, of the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, had to repeat it again for everybody to hear again and to understand that the gate is narrow. The gate is straight. And for us to get into the way, we cannot jump the fence we must pass through that gate. We're looking at Luke chapter 13 verse 23. And then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Somebody was interested. Instead of uh, knowing whether he himself will be saved or not, he wanted to know, are we going to be many there? Are there few? That are going to be saved. Here is the answer of the Lord. And he said unto them. Strive to enter in. At the straight gate. Strive. Endeavor. Do your very best. And whatever you have to go through. And deal. So that you will be able to enter in. Do it. There will be things that will try to stand in your way. There will be things that will try to disturb you. Hinder you from trying to get in. Something within, something around, something from outside. There's something within your own spirit, within your own heart that will be dragging you down. That will say, you don't have to do that. You don't have to deny yourself. You don't have to bear the cross. You don't have to get off all those weights of sin. The sin that does so easily beset us. You don't have to get through all that. There will be things within your own thoughts, your own mind. There will be things that will be telling you, you don't have to be that strict to be able to get to heaven. That's what Jesus Christ said, strive. Strive with that thing within you that is trying to say, take it easy. Go slowly. Don't put so much pressure on yourself. And don't put such a great demand on yourself. Get into heaven is not that tough. That's what I think inside will be telling you. After all, everybody else is doing it. But Jesus said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Apart from things within, there are things around that will be trying to put some pressure on you. That, you know, to live in this day in which we live and to be able to make it in this life in which we live, you have to accommodate this and compromise this and yield to this and agree to that and go this less. All those things will put in some pressure on you. That's why Jesus said, from within and from without, internal, external, you're going to have those challenges, except you break loose from them. And you set your eyes on that golden city, and you strive. You'll not be able to get in. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able They'll seek to it. They'll take life easy. They'll think it's not necessary to have repentance. It's, I, I don't want to get myself through that restitution. I don't want to think about righteousness. I know God is merciful. They'll be gentle on themselves. They'll be soft on themselves. They'll say, I just want to enter in. I don't want to take religion so tough, so high, so hard, like all those other people. The way of repentance, the way of restitution, the way of righteousness, the way of self-denial, the way of the cross that leads home. I don't want to go that way. I just want to go my own gentle way and get there. It takes more than that. That's why Jesus said many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. In verse 25, when once the master of the house is risen up 
and I shut the door. And ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Those are the people that pray too late. Lord, Lord, open unto us. At the time they ought to pray, they will not pray. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and enter in at the gate. At that time, no, they don't have time for the Lord. They're too much in a hurry. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do that. I don't have too much time for too much religion now. But at last, at that final time, when the opportunity is gone, then they will pray, but they will pray too late. Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not, once ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. You have taught in our street. We heard you when you said, Enter ye in. At the straight gate, we heard you when you said, For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. At that time, we didn't know it was that serious. We heard when you said, when you were teaching on a street, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that found it, that find it, we heard. But at that time, we didn't know it. It will be that serious. We thought you are going to relax the room, and eventually we'll be able to get in. Then shall he begin to say, and but he shall say, I tell you, I know you not. Once ye are, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Verse 28, there shall be weeping and gnashing of tears. When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God and behold their last shall be false and there shall be there are first which shall be last. I pray you'll be there. I said you'll be there. Now this gate that the Lord spoke about, and now you know the Lord Jesus was not speaking to pagans. He wasn't speaking to idol worshippers. He was speaking who was he speaking to by the way? Number one he was speaking to the people that had heard, ye have heard that it had been said by them of old time thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. These were religious people. They had heard. They went to synagogue. They heard some kind of superficial interpretation of the word of God. And Jesus still said, enter ye in at the straight gate. Not only that. These were people who had come from all beyond Jordan. And they had gone to listen to John the Baptist. Bring forth fruit. Meet unto repentance. And when Jesus Christ came, those people went away from John because John was now in prison. And then they came to listen to Jesus. And Jesus said, I know you have gone to John, John the Baptist, and you have listened to him, but you have not entered in yet. He preached good message, he preached a good word, but you have not responded. Enter ye in at the straight gate. I'm telling you that these were people who had been healed and delivered of various diseases. You find that in Matthew chapter 4. Before you even come to Matthew chapter 5, look at Matthew chapter 4. I'm reading there from uh, verse 24. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and, uh, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those which were uh, at the palsy. And he healed them, and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. In verse chapter 5, and seeing the multitudes, they went up into a mountain. And when it was said, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and taught 
them. These were people who had been healed. And yet, they had not been saved. You know, healing is for the body. Salvation is for the soul. Healing makes you to enjoy some convenience here on earth. Salvation makes you to have heaven. There's a difference between healing and salvation. Enter through the gate. You know, there are many people, they've gone to church and they think that's enough. That's not enough. They've listened to the greatest of preachers because Jesus said, of all that have been born of women, there is nobody greater than John the Baptist until that time. And these people had listened to that great preacher, John the Baptist, but they were not saved yet. Not only that, the Lord Jesus Christ had manifested his miracle working power and they had been healed and delivered, but they were not saved yet. Enter ye in at the straight gate because narrow straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it which gate is this by the way is the gate of repentance Jesus Christ himself emphasized that that's how to get to the kingdom Mark chapter 1 Verses 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. You see that? That's the gauge. That's how to enter. That's how to get to the kingdom of God. Repent ye. What does it mean to repent? Turn. A change of life. A change of mind. A change of spirit. A change of direction. A change of character. Turn away from every sin of the past. Turn to the Savior. Repent. Turn away from your sin. And believe the gospel. The glorious gospel. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. That's the way to get to the kingdom. Repent ye therefore. Recognize sin as sinful. Recognize how deadly, how terrible sin is. Recognize the damnation the destruction that comes as a result of sinning and turn away from all those sins repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out that is the Lord is telling us there except you turn except you repent except you move away except you totally reject all your evil ways of the past there is no forgiveness there's no salvation there's no blotting out of the sin look at that again verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. What kind of blessing? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's the gauge to turn you away from your iniquity, from your sin. That uh, there comes a moment in your life, a definite time in your life that you say, now I want to enter in through the gate. And you know that uh, that's not a long process. Salvation is an instantaneous experience. It takes place at a moment of time that you realize you are a sinner. You realize you cannot save yourself. You realize by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in the sight of God. 
You realize, could my tears forever flow and my zeal no respite? No, all for all for all all these for sin cannot atone. I must turn away from my sin and look at the Savior that died for me at a moment of time, instantaneous experience. You turn away from sin, you turn to the Lord, you enter in through the gate. That's what it says. You know, there are people that you ask, them, Are you sage? I'm trying to get sage. I don't do this again. I don't do this again. I don't do this. There's a process in their mind. And they think it's a gradual sin. Gradual sin. No, it's an entering into the gate, through the gate. It's an instantaneous experience. You are outside, you enter. The next moment, you are inside the salvation. It tells us in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I'm reading from Bostachi. And at times of this ignorance, God went out. But now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's the gauge. It's the gauge of repentance. Chapter 20 of Acts. Acts chapter 20 verse 20. Acts chapter 20 verse 20. And how I kept back nothing. That was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God. You see that? Repentance toward God. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that then that and what the Lord is saying is that we enter we enter in. And then as we enter in, we now begin to walk in the way that leads unto life eternal. As you, as you enter, the Lord is just waiting for you there to receive you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Very simple. Just turn away from sin. Turn away from darkness and turn to Christ, the light of the world. He will save you. And everyone, as you come to the Lord, then he'll give you the grace. And the grace is to help you now to now walk, walk, walk in the way that leads unto life. You know, there are people that say they get saved and they just stay there at the gate. They stand still at the gate. They don't go to church. They don't treat the Bible. They don't ask the Lord, what will you have me to do? They do not go in the way of obedience. All they have is, I got saved. I got saved. They enter in through the gate and there they stand still. But the Lord says, when you enter through the gate and you walk in the way that leads unto life. I pray God will give all of us the grace to walk in that narrow path, narrow way that leads into heaven in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number two. The narrow way to everlasting life followed by few. The narrow way to everlasting life followed by few. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 14. Because stretch is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Which leadeth unto life. That means then there is a road, there is a way, there is a path. From the point you are born again, that's the gate, until the time you get to the final destination. Which is life eternal. Yeah, that way leads unto life eternal. Which means then you must follow that way. You must walk in that way. It tells us in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, I'm reading from Bostachi. It says, I have chosen the way of truth. This way is the way of truth. The way of error will not lead into the kingdom of God. The way of falsehood will not lead into the kingdom of God. The way of error will not lead into the kingdom of God. That's why it's important. After you are saved, it's important where you worship, where you fellowship. 
It's very important that you'll find out is the way of truth. They're teaching the truth of scripture, the truth of the Bible, and they make it very plain and very clear. I can see this is the way of truth. It is following that way of truth that leads unto life eternal. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. But start it you. I will run the way of thy commandments. You know the way that he's talking about is the way of obedience. Obedience to the commandment of God. If you find anybody that says, well, I'm a Christian, but I throw all the commandments of God, I throw them behind me. I don't have anything to do with the commandments of God. That's not salvation. When you are saved, you get in through the gate. And then you now walk in the way that leads unto life eternal. And it is the way of thy commandments. When thou shalt enlarge my heart. Verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. And I shall keep it unto the end. That's important. Unto the end. That means you start and the Lord will keep you. It will hold your hand. When challenges come, just look to the Lord. It will help you. And sometimes, you know, temptations will come, trials will come, difficulties will come. You keep on looking to the Lord. You say, Lord, I'm not strong. My strength is in you. You say, Lord, I don't know everything, but my knowledge is in you. And you're giving me the knowledge and the wisdom, the understanding that will lead me to that life eternal. And once you are dependent upon the Lord like that, and you're not independent, you're not isolated. You do not remove your hand away from the hand of the Lord. The Lord is of mighty strength. It will carry you through. Look at that verse 3 again. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. And I shall keep it unto the end. I, we're looking at Psalm 143, verse 8 and verse 10. Psalm 143, verse 8. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. For I lift up my soul unto thee. That's the way. Let me know the way I should walk. You know, when we get saved, at the point of that salvation, what, what do we know? We know next to nothing. We just give our lives to the Lord. We just turn away from our sins. And we do not know every doctrine of the Bible. That's why we're telling the Lord, cause me to hear, make me to hear, make me to learn of thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust, cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. In verse 10, teach me to do thy will is a confession and acceptance of our ignorance and that's what God wants you tell the Lord I don't know everything I don't know what I should do I don't know I should live I don't know what comportment conduct character I should have oh Lord teach me he says to do thy will for thou art my God thy spirit is good lead me in the land of uprightness the Lord will do it we're told in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 28. Proverbs chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 28. In the way of righteousness is life. When Jesus said, enter through the gate at the gate. But narrow, straight is the gate. And narrow too is the way that leads unto life. Number one is the way of truth. Number two, it's the way of righteousness. And it's when you take that way of righteousness, then you will get to that life eternal at the end. In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. Look at chapter 15 of Proverbs. Proverbs 15, we're looking at verse 28. The heart of the righteous studies. Uh, chapter 15, we're looking at verse 24. Verse 24. It says, the way of life is above to the wise. God will make you wise. He, and that he may depart from hell beneath. The way of life leads you to life above. So that as you are following that way of the Lord, that's what the Lord is talking about. 
You don't live like the unbelievers live anymore. You don't go to the places they go anymore. And the grace of God is there. And that grace of God is keeping you. And it makes you to always avoid, always run away from the way of hell. You want to escape. Isaiah chapter 35. In Isaiah chapter 35, we're reading from verse 8. Isaiah 35, verse 8. And an highway shall be there, and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. You get the point now when Jesus said, Because narrow is the way. What way is that? It says, The way of truth. It says the way of righteousness. Here he calls it the way of holiness. And then it says the unclean shall not pass over it. The unclean shall not pass over it. How? Look up here. Here is the gate. And then you cannot get into the way without going through the gate. When you get to the gate, you repent. Your sins are forgiven. The blood of Jesus washes you whiter than snow. And then as you move now into the way, there is no sin. They are forgiven. They are taken away. If the Son shall set you free, he shall be free indeed. That's why it says there is no way the unclean will get into that way. Because the only way to get into that way, the only possibility of getting into that way is through the gate. And the moment you pass through that gate, the sins are forgiven. The sins are cleansed. The sins are washed away. And it makes you righteous. I read that again in verse 8. And the highway shall be there. And the way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be. For those the way fearing men. Though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there. Praise the Lord. You don't have any fear that you know as I'm walking in the way what if a lion meets me on that way no lion shall be there all your enemies are crushed and totally conquered and the Lord will make you go through without any danger just keep your eyes on the Lord and it says no ravenous bee shall go up thereon it shall not be found there but the redeemed shall walk there and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion and then it says with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads and then it says they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sign shall flee away amen we're looking at second Peter now chapter 2 second Peter chapter 2 I'm reading verse 20 Second Peter chapter 2 verse 20 here is where a child of God will pay attention. Here is where somebody who really wants to get to heaven will pay attention. Here is where somebody who is a real child of God, he has gone through the gate. He is walking in the way. Here is the point. He must not be overconfident. You know Peter, Simon Peter. He already entered through the gate. And then he was walking in the way. And the Lord told him, dangers ahead temptations ahead trials ahead challenges ahead oh and he said Lord don't worry about me over confidence that's what you must never never allow in your heart in your life over confidence because those who are overconfident when the temptation comes they trip, they fall, and eventually they return from the way of righteousness and then they leave the narrow way and they go back to the broad way. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they had escaped, they have escaped from the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and the Savior Jesus Christ. Those are the people that entered in through the gate. They escaped the pollution and the corruption of the world and the lost of the world. And they escaped that by going through the gate, through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. It says, they are again entangled therein. 
That means they leave the narrow way. They get involved in the broad way again. And they're again entangled in the past life. Then it says, the latter, and they're overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. They knew the way of righteousness. They were walking in the way of righteousness. And it says now, because they went back out of that way of righteousness, it were better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. And then it says in verse 22, but it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the soul that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. Can I just show you some examples of those who did that? They were in the narrow way, overconfidence, not watching, not praying, not looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And then temptation comes, trial comes, and they forget themselves. And then they go back to the broad way from which they had been saved. Exodus chapter 32. In Exodus chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 7. Exodus chapter 32. We're looking at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. Would you note then you have entered through the gate, praise the Lord, and you're walking the narrow way that leads to heaven. Glory be to God. Don't be overconfident. Don't think I'm there, I'm there forever. Watch and pray. Let's see fall into temptation. These people, they went through the gate. You remember the lamp was killed. And then the blood was applied. And he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And they went from death unto life eternal. Justification by faith in the blood of the lamb. That's the gate. And now they came out of Egypt and they were walking in the way. And the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud was before them, leading them, guiding them the way they ought to go. That's the way. But now Moses went to the mountain top and just spent some days over there. And he said, We cannot see a leader. We cannot see Moses. And because we cannot see him, he ran up. Make us, let's see something. And then they went back to the way of Egypt. And God said, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. They have made them a molten calm and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, This be thy gods, o, o Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. What's the result of that? Verse 10. Now therefore... Let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. You see the anger of the Lord against the people that go out of the way. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Getting out of the way. And you know there are people that will try to get you out of the way. And they'll tell, they have a better thing. They have an alternative. They have a simpler way. And they have a more beautiful way. And then they'll describe it to you. Don't listen to them. The Lord has brought you through the gates. Thank God you are born again. And the Lord has been leading you step after step in his word. And the grace of God has been helping you to be obedient to the Lord. Don't listen to the people that will tell you to go back into another way. Deuteronomy chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. If they arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give it thee a sign or a wonder and the sign of the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying let us go after other gods which thou hast not known 
and let us serve them. And he's saying that, you know, God is not in all. The one that delivered you out of the land of Egypt is not enough. The one that ransomed you is not enough. The one that got you through the Red Sea, that's not enough. And the one that is giving you manna every day, that's not enough. The one that has the canopy of protection, a cloud of a cloud of fire and cloud, a pillar of fire and cloud of a of a the, the, the pillar of cloud over you. They say that's not enough. They say, let's go to another God. And then it says in verse 3, thou shalt not hack in unto the words of that prophet or that dream of dreams for the Lord your God proves you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in verse 4 ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him and that prophet or that dream of dreams shall be put to death count him as dead and don't commune with the dead. Don't relate with the dead. Don't interact with the dead. Don't go and visit the dead. Because their pathway is death. And it says, shall put him to death. Because they are spoken to turn you away. From the Lord your God. Which brought you out of the land of Egypt. And redeemed you out of the house of, of, of bondage. Listen to this. To thrust thee out of the way. To thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall thou put evil away from the midst of thee. We will not follow them. I said you will not follow them. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 16. Proverbs 21 verse 16. The man that wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. The man that wanders away from the way of understanding. Look at the understanding the Lord has given us in his word. As we study from verse to verse, from chapter to chapter. And anybody that will leave something like this and then wander away from the way of understanding, he will join the people who are in the broad way. Those are dead people. They're dead spiritually. You'll be in the congregation of the dead. That's why the Lord is warning us remain in the way of righteousness. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. When you find your feet shaking, when you find your feet weak, when you find your mind weak, and then you have to come to the house of God. And you're saying, I don't know whether I'm going to go today or not. My mind is weak. My heart is weak. And then instead of getting to the bus stop with excitement and then with joy, let us go into the house of the Lord. You are dragging your feet. You are taking this and dropping it and taking this and dropping it. Your spiritual feet is becoming lame. And it says in that verse 13, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. That's the beginning of the devil trying to turn you out of the narrow way that leads to heaven. And you will say, no devil, you will not succeed. And Satan will not succeed upon your life. And then it says in that verse 13, but let it rather be healed. Come to the house of the Lord. And let him give you strength for your weakness. Come to the house of the Lord. And let him give you healing. For your spiritual and physical sickness. Come to the house of the Lord. And then all your feet that were shaking before. When you come to the house of the Lord. Once again you will receive strength from the Lord. The Lord will touch you. And the touch of the Lord will bring strength to your life. To your soul. To your spirit. And to your feet. And once again you will be walking in that path. That leads to heaven in Jesus name. We come now to point number three. The never ending wonder. 
in eternity for the faithful few. The never ending wonder for in eternity for the faithful few. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7 and we're looking at verse 14 again. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 14 it says because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Which leadeth unto life. And then it says and few there be that find it. It will start with you know sometimes the devil comes to you. Now it comes to everyone. He even came to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that doesn't make you a sinner. That doesn't make you a backslider. The devil can whisper in your ears. You can still be a child of God. The devil can bring temptation. You're still a child of God. The devil can begin to talk to you and begin to reason with you. You're still a child of God. The devil reason with Christ and try to talk him out of the way of the Lord. But Christ was still Christ. And so sometimes the devil will come to you and say, now think about it. How many people believe what you believe? How many people stand on what you stand? How many people have the same, the same conviction as you have? How many people hold the Bible the way you hold the Bible? How many people actually believe that without holiness no man shall see the Lord? And then if you're not careful, you begin to reply. And you say, well, looks like, uh, well, it's not many people believe that. There you are. Now, do you think that only the minority will be right? That's the devil talking. Do you think that only few people count them? One, two, three. Just those few people. Look at all those multitudes. So people people and they are saying hallelujah praise the Lord and they too they are saying they are going to heaven do you think that those multitudes of people are wrong and do you think that you among the few among the minority do you think that you are the only right people repentance and, and restitution and righteousness and faith in Christ and holiness and bearing the cross and denying yourself to follow Christ do you think that only those few people will make it to heaven don't listen to him don't, don't discuss with him that devil is clever even try to tell Jesus to worship him. Think about that. Don't argue with him. Just say, leave me alone. I know whom I believed. And I know that I've committed my soul into his hand. And this word that he has given me, Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today and forever. And because of the unchanging Christ, here is the unchanging word. His word will never change. I said this word will never change. And he said, few there be that find it. And thank God you are part of that few. Anytime the devil tries to bring discouragement, just say, well, thank God I have what multitudes don't have. And I know what multitudes don't know. And I'm on the way that multitudes have not discovered. I'm one of the faithful few. And I pray the Lord will keep you faithful to the end in Jesus' name. But now it says, this is the way, the narrow way that leadeth unto life. That leadeth unto life. When Jesus said that, he indicated that all the joy, all the glory, all the inheritance, all the state and bliss, all the happiness and the perfect rest that believers are going to have when we get to heaven. He came from heaven. He knows about heaven. He went back to heaven. He knows all about heaven. He is now in heaven making intercession for you and for me. And he's preparing a place in the mansions of heaven for you and for his people. He knows what no man on earth knows about heaven. Anytime the devil tries to confuse you, just say, I don't know that. But Jesus, my Savior, knows the scientist doesn't know that but Jesus my savior knows because Jesus knows more than any man on earth am I right? Jesus is wiser and Jesus has gone to a place where all the scientists of the world have never gone because you see as Jesus rose from the dead he appeared by many infallible proofs unto his disciples and then on that final day the 40th day he, they saw him like this after he appeared unto them and then he was taken away and they saw he went into heaven show me any scientist 
Show me any biologist. Show me any psychologist who has gone like that up into heaven in the presence of his own learners, of his own disciples, of his own students. Only Christ. And it is that Christ that says there is a place that is called heaven. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. As those disciples who are watching Jesus Christ like this going up, they said, thank you, Jesus. I remember what you said, I know where you are going. And you are going to prepare a place for me. And then he said, and I will come again. He's coming back again for you. Always remember that at the time of temptation, at the time of trial, at the time when the persecution and the pressure is so much upon your life, remember it will not belong. Christ will come back for you. And then he'll take you up to that heaven. The future destiny of those who persevere on the narrow way till the end is glorious beyond what human tongues can tell. In heaven, we shall be in a, in a better state. We shall be present with the Lord. We shall shine as the sun, as the sun in the famine forever and ever. We'll have the radiance of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he had on the Mount of Transfiguration. In heaven, we shall be like the angels of God. We shall be with Christ where he is, and then we shall behold his glory, and we ourselves shall have his glory revealed in us. That heaven, you will get there. Heaven, a better place and the most beautiful place on earth. The Lord has gone to prepare a place for you and for each pilgrim who endures to the end. It's a place of perfect security. A place of perfect rest. And we shall be like him. And we shall, we shall be with him as well. In heaven, there will be no sorrow. Give me a good amen. No tears. All your tears will be wiped away. No hunger, no, no poverty again, no thirst, no more curse, no sickness, no pain, no death. And thank God, that's the place you are going. I said that's the place you are going. You set your face as a flinch and nothing will drive you back. And remember, days when days are tough. When the challenges are great, when the mountain appears high, when the slope is too steep, and when the road is rough, when the voice of the enemy Satan is sounding too loud, just block your ears to what the devil is saying, and then, like the pilgrim, the Christian in the previous progress, be shouting, Heaven, eternal life, heaven, eternal life. Before long, the Lord will come to you, He'll hold your hand, He'll sit, cheer up son, cheer up daughter, the time is up, let's go home I'll see you there I said I'll see you there because at the end of that narrow way, that's life eternal, we shall be there let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer, that the Lord will take you there Never mind the challenge today. Never mind the difficulties today. We shall be there. The Lord is taking us there. We're getting there. We're going there in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, help me. Are you being tempted today? Hey, don't, don't worry. The temptation will pass. The challenges will pass away. Just say, Lord, hold my hand. Help me. I want to be there. Help me. I want to be. You'll be there. You'll be there. It's by grace. It's by grace. The grace of God is available to everyone, for everyone. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Enter through the gate if you have not been born again. Just say, Lord, I know Christ died for me. Christ died for me. And because he died for me, I know, I know, I'm going to get there. You'll get there. Give your hand to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord. But you'll say, I'm weak. He is your strength. I'm feeling tired. He'll give you the spiritual energy. I don't think I'll be able to face all the trials and all the persecution. No, he'll face everything for you. He'll go through for you. He'll be going side by side with you. In a time of weakness, in the time of sickness, in a time of challenges. 
He'll stay with you. He'll abide with you. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what challenges may come upon my life. Believe the Lord. If you have not been born again, just call upon the Lord. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever. He loves you. And he doesn't want you to perish. That's why he came from heaven. And he came to save you. And also say, Lord, receive me. He will receive you. Lord, save me. He will save you. Lord, forgive me. He will forgive you. Enter through the gate. It doesn't take a long process. An instantaneous experience. As you believe on the Lord, he gets you saved. He gets you saved. All the sins you committed since you were born. Everything is forgiven. As you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then now he holds your hand. And step by step. Step by step. One step at a time. He leads you in the way that leads unto heaven. You are precious in his sight. He has a place in heaven for you. When the days are hard, tough, when the challenges are great and high, remember the Lord who has saved you will lead you through. The Lord who has saved you will lead you through. There's no temptation so tough, there's no situation so difficult that the Lord will not be with you. He'll abide with you, He'll stay with you. Until the end. Give him your hand. He will hold your hand. He will not leave you. Until he takes you to heaven. He has prepared a place for you already. Don't allow your place in heaven to be vacant. 